а секако во држави како што сме ние представува посебен проблем во однос на работите кои би требало да се прават до каде се прават и како би можело да се прават. Ние а, овој ден го посветивме да биде а, одбележен на ваков начин, бидејќи а, со сите околности и сите а, до сега постигнати работи, а, ова го сметам за одбележување, како што и прилега на оваа институција, бидејќи во овие 17 години и јас и сите вие на некој начин со мене а, поминавме разни фази, значи од да кажам рагањето, па до денес и е, се надевам за една година ќе биде полнолетни и многу позрели. Имавме и фази на почетен пубертет и сите други работи кои сите ние лично сме ги поминале на некој начин, а сето тоа се поминува и во една организација и јас е, сум горд што имам таков тим околу мене да можеме сега во оваа институција како што е со сите технички и технолошки можности да го дадеме она што со години наназад е, сме се труделе, сме се образувале, сме се е, организирале да сето тоа функционира. И ова е еден мал допринос на мојот поглед на свет, дека треба и да се дружиме, треба да споделуваме некои искуства и мора се тоа да го заокружуваме на ваков начин, а, бидејќи се тоа на зборување од некаде, од некој нешто рекол, а, нешто чул, а не разбрал, е веќе нешто друго. Медицината има а, свои правила, е, свои а, а, патишта и Ние сите тука како медицинари треба тие да ги следеме. Така да, еве ова нека биде еден почеток на едно дружење кое ние намераваме и со други теми да го актуализираме. Секој еден проблем кој не мачи нас, ги мачи пациентите и да допринесеме до подобро разбирање на некои работи. Ам... Толку од мене за сега. Еве... Осто Спиловски ќе, ќе продолжи он е модераторот на, на овој ден, па да ги најави гостите и да, тако да, да каже кратко за секој од нив о нешто и да почнеме со програмата. Благодарам. Првиот предавач е доктор Петар Патлер. Тој е фокусиран на ненормалната секреција на инсулин кај диабет, причините за смртта на бета клетките кај шеќерната болест и можноста да се потикне регенерација на панкреасните островчиња и има различна терминологија како ја вика. По дипломирањето на Универзитетот по Бирмингам во Велика Британија во 80-та година, доктор Петар Батлеб завршил специализација по интерна медицина во Единбург, Ньюкасл во Велика Британија, понатаму продолжил со субспециализација по ендокринологија, исто така во Ньюкасл, потоа и на Меоклиниката во Рочестер во Минесота, каде што бил и соработник и стражувач. Бил поставен на висока работна позиција при клиничкиот факултет на Меоклиниката по ендокринологија, диабет и болести на метаболизмот. Тој исто така бил помошник директор на Генералниот клинички центар за истражување финансирана од националните институти за здравство. По 6 години на факултетот на клиниката МЕО тој бил назначен за председател на диабетот при Универзитетот во Единбург во Шкотска, каде што го основи првиот клинички центар за истражување во Велика Британија. Тој се вратил во САД во 1999 година, кога бил назначен за шеф на ендокринологија, шеќер на болес и хипертензија на Универзитетот во Јужна Калифорнија во Лос Анджелес во 2002 година. Доктор Петар Батлер има основано Лари Хил Блумовиот истражувачки центар за панкреасни островчиња, 
институција каде што се сместени истражувачи кои се фокусирани на промените кои што ги предизвикуваат или врз кои се е, остваруваат негативни или позитивни действа. Тој исто така е и шеф на катедрата на одделението за ендокринологија, диабет и хипертензија. Негова клиничка пракса во Лос Анджелес се фокусира на заштита на пациентите со диабет. Главно тоа се особините. Dear Dr. Butler, I just uh, presented your very short uh, biography and uh, you may take a floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations uh, on the Mitriff uh, birthday. A fantastic clinic. I've just been around it and I was fortunate to spend 10 years at the Mayo Clinic and I'm going to make a prediction that this is the Mayo Clinic of Central Europe in years to come. I think this is such a beautiful facility and already on such a good track that um, I'm, I'm going to be excited to watch how it evolves. I apologize, I speak no Macedonian. So I hope you can follow my presentation. I'm really here as the warm-up act for the main feature, which is the next speaker, who is one of your own, and who I'm very fortunate is one of my colleagues at UCLA, who's doing beautiful work. So I'm sort of putting her work in context. And so my question is, why do we have so many people with diabetes right now? Why is this becoming such a common problem? So, because not all of you worry about glucose metabolism, very briefly we're going to go back through the why we have glucose. If you don't have glucose in your blood, you're unconscious, your brain needs glucose, and so when you're asleep in the night, you're not eating glucose, your brain and other tissues are burning glucose. And if you didn't have some means of replacing the glucose that your brain was using, your blood sugar would fall. It doesn't because your liver makes sugar, puts it into your blood at the same speed that you're using it to keep the blood sugar constant. So for the liver to know how to do that, there must be a signal to the liver, and there is, and it comes from the pancreas, this organ in the back of your abdomen, inconveniently located, the size of your hand, that senses the prevailing glucose and secretes the hormone insulin into the blood, directly to the liver, as little pulses every four minutes, and that in, uh, slows down the release of sugar from your liver. So the regulation of blood sugar is very simple. It's the islets of Langerhan, named after the German medical student who found them. And they sense the prevailing glucose, secrete insulin into your blood, and that insulin slows down the release of glucose from your liver. So for the system, if it is not working, either you've got a problem in the liver, you've got a problem in the pancreas. It has to be one of these two. So when I went off to medical school, they taught me that diabetes was a disease of aging. If you didn't type 2 diabetes, you just got it if you were older. As you heard, I was at medical school in Britain. This is showing you elderly Brits on the beach in Britain, where it's cold. That's what you wear on the beach there. And they are um, the age group that we saw people with diabetes. There was not much obesity then. But as people became more obese, we saw more diabetes younger, so here are two Brits, two British people from the pub, I guess, getting a little bigger. And the way we see diabetes now, in particularly perhaps in, in Los Angeles, looks a lot like this. We have a uh, certain ethnic groups are more vulnerable, and this gentleman is of an Indian nation background. And we know there are risk factors that include sleep deprivation, the exposure to light at night, uh, sedentary behavior, a lot of time spent driving, uh, eating their own foods. Uh, many of these things happen in our lifestyle, that we're perhaps overworked, stressed, spend too much time uh, in front of a computer, too little time exercising. So to illustrate some of these things in Los Angeles, those of you who haven't visited, this is our biggest freeway, the 405 freeway. You can spend a lot of time sitting on this freeway. Uh, UCLA is uh, not far from here. Um, I get the pointer, it's up here. So that's Los Angeles, up at UCLA in this area. So many people coming to work at UCLA live on this freeway for a lot of their morning. And 
unfortunately, this is a common food choice in California um, and is well recognized as being related to obesity. This graph shows you how much sugar has been eaten per year in the uh, North America since 1700 to the year 2000, and then also shows you the prevalence of obesity. And as you can see, the sugar intake from 1700 to 1850 was modest, and then began to increase. It's particularly steeply increased over the last 50 years at a time when the obesity epidemic really has hit. So what we're eating has clearly changed. And then this concept of light at night. So it used to be that when it got dark, you maybe read a book by normal daylight, but devices like your phones, your laptops, your TVs release blue light that tells your eye that it's daytime. And increasingly we now recognize that people who work on shifts, sorry if there are nurses in the room, and people who have disturbed sleep have a much greater risk for type 2 diabetes than people who don't. So <coughs> night at light is actually a, a substantial risk factor for type 2 diabetes. So if I come back to the list of known risk factors for diabetes here, the first group, obesity, sedentary behavior, sleep disruption, transiently during pregnancy, if you have liver disease, if you have good recordable treatment, these are all known to cause insulin resistance, that you need more insulin to act on the liver to suppress it when glucose release. And so that's a group together. And then the other two there in their family history and pesticides seem to be in a different group, and I'll come to those in a minute. So again, when I was at medical school, they taught us that type 2 diabetes was caused by insulin resistance, and this insulin resistance caused the islets that make insulin to fail, to fail. they wore out. And then eventually the beta cells would give up and you had diabetes. The problem with that is that it doesn't really explain why some people who are insulin resistant get diabetes, and many people who are insulin resistant don't get diabetes. One of the commonest theories as to why the islets fail with insulin resistance is because fat accumulates in the pancreas and causes the islets to fail. We asked that question at UCLA, looking at the amount of fat there is in the pancreas measured here in a whole bunch of different people who had had a CT scan. And the red dots are people who have diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and the green dots are people who do not. And the vertical scale shows you the amount of fat in their pancreas versus their body mass index, a measure of their obesity. And you can see the green and red dots are all scattered around. It is true that if you gain weight and become overweight, you have more fat in your pancreas, but there's a lot of variability. But you'll see that there's really no dis difference between the red dots and the green dots. You can't explain who's going to get type 2 diabetes based on fat in the pancreas. So we think that that theory is overplayed. So another way to look at who's going to get type 2 diabetes is to realize that there's a series of risk factors, some of which I've listed here, and that fortunately, 80% of us in this room, if we have those risk factors, actually don't get diabetes. You, most people who are morbidly obese just make more insulin, and they don't get diabetes. Most people who are night nurses don't get diabetes. There's 20% of us, on average, in the population, however, who are vulnerable to type 2 diabetes. And if we get obese, or multiple pregnancies, or liver disease, we need to go on steroids, then in those individuals, they do get diabetes. And instead of the islets of Langerhans adapting and making more insulin, these islets fail and make less insulin. So to understand why and who is going to get diabetes, it seems as though the answer lies in the pancreas and why some islets succeed and some islets fail. So our journey in research in this area, therefore, has focused on the pancreas. And as we've done that, first of all, you have to recognize, as those of you in the medical field in this room know, the pancreas is a very inconvenient organ to study. It's retroperitoneal. It's mostly exocrine tissue, which will destroy everything around it if you, if you mess around with it, and lies <coughs> right at the, uh, and the uh, <coughs> back of the patient's abdomen, far from any research needles. The islets of Langerhans are one million in number in a human, roughly. Stain for insulin here shows a human islet stained in purple, and you can see the insulin-making cells, the beta cells, are about 2,000 cells 
per islet. We have about a million of these. Um, and if we go now right down to electron microscopy, you see what one beta cell looks like. Here you now see um, lots of crystals of insulin. Here are the mitochondria, which you're going to hear later, are very important in how beta cells work, making the energy for them to be able to work and also to sense the prevailing glucose. And the insulin is secreted from these cells into the capillary here uh, when the glucose rises. How much insulin does a cell, a beta cell, in a patient or a person um, have to make in a day? The answer is pretty impressive. So each of pancreatic beta cell uh, in a healthy human has to make, oops, excuse me, has to make and secrete approximately uh, 15,000 insulin molecules per cell per minute, or well, that's 20 million molecules per cell per day. So this is my little cartoon of the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria working closely to provide the energy for the new insulin produced here. And as I said, each one of your beta cells has to make about 20 million insulin molecules a day. Importantly, about 3,000 of those uh, per minute have to be degraded. And so when they, they, they fail quality control and they end up having to be removed from the, uh, from the pancreas, from the, excuse me, from the cell, and as you can see in this cartoon here, there is two systems of getting rid of cells of um, proteins that are misfolded. So 80% of your proteins in a beta cell successfully go down the Golgi pathway secretory vesicle and will be secreted. 20% are considered um, failures of synthesis. Imagine you have a car factory, you're making cars, every now and again a car is uh, not put together right, you've got to break it up and start over. These insulin molecules get removed by two pathways, the ubiquitin protein serum system or the autophagy pathway, and re degraded. And when you have such a high flux of new protein synthesis, these pathways are very important in these cells. And if they don't work well, you can start to have um, cells begin to degrade. I'm having trouble with the pointer, so I'm going to stop pointing, I think. So now to type 2 diabetes. In the top panel shows you again an islet with the non-diabetic individual, and the bottom panel shows you someone with type 2 diabetes. Uh, with islet, uh, with the, thank you for producing the water. The, the, the difference between the two is quite, hopefully quite obvious. You can see there are less purple cells in the lower panel than there are in the top panel. Patients with type 2 diabetes have less insulin. And the cells are about a half in number compared to someone who doesn't have diabetes. So there's a specific pathology of reduced cells that make insulin, but also between the cells, you'll see that there is this pink area in the lower panel that is not, not cells, but is made of amyloid. And amyloid is a protein aggregate that shouldn't be there and has formed from a protein called islet amyloid polypeptide that is co-expressed and co-secreted with insulin by beta cells. So <clears throat> this is a specific pathology of people with type 2 diabetes. Why is this islet amyloid polypeptide there? And um, how is it, what is it composed of? Um, this just shows you graphically on the top right that the beta cell number is reduced in people with type 2 diabetes and that the cells are, have increased cell death in people with type 2 diabetes. So those 20% of people who when they're insulin resistant are exposed to increased demand on the beta cells, they're losing their beta cells and they have this islet amyloid forming and the cells they're losing are losing through the process of apoptosis. So the amyloid, is, as I say, is composed of this protein called islet amyloid polypeptide. And the human version of it is shown up across the top here for amino acids. And then in comparison, you can see other species, monkey, cat, mouse, rat, below it. Where the um, amino acids are identical, there's a little dot. And where there's different amino acids, you see another letter. And the part of this protein that has the, makes the uh, protein sticky and likely to form amyloid is shown in pink. And you can see the human and the monkey and the cat are very similar in that pink area. And interestingly, humans, monkeys, and cats are the three species that are vulnerable for developing type 2 diabetes. So if you have a pet cat and it gets overweight, they can get type 2 diabetes. Mice and rats, in contrast, have these three proline residues there, and they do not get diabetes. And so the presence of this particular sequence in this amino acids of this protein that's co-expressed with insulin by beta cells seems to predict 
whether a species is or is not vulnerable to developing diabetes. To explore this, one obvious way to look at it would be to take the protein from a human and use it in the mouse in the transgenic technology. So you take this protein here, uh, the human IPP, you express it in mouse and see whether now mice would get diabetes. So we did this many years ago. This is a picture of the mice that we created, the yellow ones and the brown ones that are also different because they have obese versus lean mice. And we had four types of mice. We had obese mice with this human gene, lean mice with the human gene, and then obese and lean mice that did not have the human gene. And the obese mice with the human gene got diabetes. And the islets were shown uh, here, top right, is the how an islet looked in obese <coughs> transgenic mice compared to the top left, which is a obese non-transgenic mouse. And you can see now the less brown, there's less insulin, the cells have died. There's apoptosis going on measured by tunnel at the bottom. And there's areas of islet amyloid formed within these islets, derived again from the IPP. So we've recreated type 2 diabetes in a mouse by taking this single protein and expressing it in the human, the human version in the mouse. So this suggested this is important and, and it has an important contributory factor towards the diabetes. So now, of course, we're interested in why these cells that are here, the tunnel positive cells, dying as a consequence of this. And initially, we became interested in the fact that there seemed to be a, cells that were dying were not next to the amyloid. So it may not be the amyloid that was killing the cells. So we went to electron microscopy, and this shows you now an electron micrograph of a beta cell in a human with type 2 diabetes. And these little black dots are gold particles <coughs> that are labeled with an antibody against this protein IEPP. You can see that they're formed inside the cells in these strange accumulations that are not amyloid, but they're not normal. The IPP should be in the insulin crystal vesicles like this dot here. It shouldn't be outside in these large aggregates. And essentially what we uh, had discovered with these aggregates were not amyloid, but were toxic oligomers, and they seem to be causing membrane disruption and destroying cells. The structure of them has, has been solved at UCLA by the structural biologists, and this <coughs> consists of aggregates of six of the IPP molecules together in what they called a cylindrin. And this is the same structure of the aggregates that form in brain in Alzheimer's uh, or brain in Parkinson's disease. The exact same structure occurs to form these uh, toxic uh, membrane permeating uh, aggregates that occur in all these protein misfolding diseases. And so this is occurring in type 2 diabetes also. So <clears throat> having established that these are toxic, um, what they also do, unfortunately, is they cause disruption of the two major pathways of clearing misfolded proteins. And that, in turn, adds to their end toxicity because now they're removing the very mechanism that is used to clear out clear misfolded proteins. So Safia Kost, which was in the lab and now back in Montpellier in France, uh, particularly uh, elegantly illustrated this, this particular series of problems with the IPP. And, and these are some of her publications. So this now leads me to <coughs> the questions that we have left. So why does IPP oligomers form in 20% of us if we're overweight and not in the other 80%? How does IPP toxicity harm the beta cell function? Why does this form of these oligomers make the cells not work so well so they don't make enough insulin so you get diabetes? Are the functional changes reversible? And is the gradual loss of beta cells inevitable or can it be prevented? So to deal with the first question, why do IPP oligomers form in 20% of us and not in the others. Um, if you remember, we come back to this adaptive response versus maladaptive response. We're really trying to understand what is it that would pick us to be in one of the 80% or the 20% if we became insulin resistant. And to come back to our risks of type 2 diabetes, one of them down the bottom there is family history. So there's a strong family history that is implying that there are some genetic or epigenetic characteristics leading towards type 2 diabetes. And 
the genome associated studies looking for type 2 diabetes actually have been quite disappointing. They've come up with some genes, but not many. <coughs> Mostly what they've taught us, as my picture is supposed to show, is that we're much more alike than we are different. It turns out we seem to be awfully like fruit flies, as far as I can see, let alone uh, anything else. So although genetics hasn't told us a huge amount, it, all the genes that are associated with type 2 diabetes are all <coughs> genes that are associated with beta cells, particularly beta cell replication the division of beta cells. And that becomes interesting if you look at how many beta cells we have during our childhood and as we grow. So this cartoon now, this graph, shows you the number of beta cells in millions <coughs> versus age in five quintiles. And these are humans. Each one of these is sadly where a kid died young. We have the pancreas, and we've done, we've evaluated the number of beta cells in those pancreases. And what the point of the cartoon is to show you that Early on, we have all have relatively few beta cells right after birth, and then during the first two or three years of life, there's a rapid expansion in beta cell numbers through beta cell replication. But the important point is there's huge variability between groups. It's a tenfold difference, and this has been reduced by many people. So within this room, some of us have got as many as uh, two million, million beta cells, and others have got only maybe one-tenth of that. Perfectly healthy. It's no it's enough if you're well. But if you can imagine if, if both this person in blue and this person with the pink had become obese or had to have steroids for something, became insulin resistant, the workload is dramatically greater on these beta cells of the person who's born innately with relatively few beta cells. And so is this early beta cell mass set down in early life a predictor for risk for type 2 diabetes? And there's data to support that. So if you have, look at low birth weight babies that have placental dysfunction, for example, um, due to um, maybe um, a placental hypertension disease, they have a much higher risk of diabetes, type 2 diabetes in later life than people who are normal, work baby, normal birth weight babies. Kids born during famines, during the wars, they, they have a greater risk of diabetes in later life. So we think one of the risk factors, one of the things that separates those of us who are in the 80% versus the 20% may in fact be the number of beta cells you end up with early in life. So the last thing on my risk list here is pesticides. Why pesticides? Pesticides are a source of some concern. So what are persistent organic pesticides? Persistent organic pesticides are pesticides that are created so the farmer sprays them on, let's say, the lettuce, and they stay there. So when the rain falls, it doesn't wash it away. And throughout the life of that growth of that lettuce, the slugs and the snails are not going to eat the lettuce. You get to eat the lettuce. Um, the problem with persistent organic pesticides is they're, they're manufactured to be persistent, and they are. And even when you wash that lettuce in water, you don't wash the residual pesticide off. You eat it. Um, and these pesticides are becoming increasingly present in our environment. They're accumulating in fish and wild birds. And if we eat them, they get into our fat and they stay there. This graph I find worrying. This shows the synthetic, the production rate of uh, chemical production of these pesticides in blue and the diabetes prevalence in red. And it's a much better fit than anything I've seen for obesity or for sedentary behavior or sleep at night. This is the best fit we have. This graph shows you the relationship between the body mass index, three groups, lean, mod, middle, excuse me, don't do well with that pointer. So the, the, the three groups here, lean, middle, and, um, <coughs> oops, there we go. Lean, um, optimistically, not too overweight, and obese, uh, and then the, this is the amount of pesticide accumulating in the uh, fact on biopsy. And this study has been reproduced in Spain and in Finland and several other countries. And it shows that there seems to be an interaction between the presence of these pesticides accumulating and the risk of diabetes. It's pretty impressive. I was skeptical about this to begin with, but I've become concerned. And one of the key points about these pesticides is the way they work. And they obviously kill the insects, because otherwise you would be, um, you know, would, you wouldn't use them. But they also um, cause protein, misfolded proteins to accumulate. That's part of how they work. 
And so knowing now how beta cells get into trouble in diabetes, it's a source of concern, I think, that we have uh, accumulated these in our environment. So I'm going to round up then with a sort of summary of what I think leads to the increased risks of type 2 diabetes. On the left, you have obesity, sedentary sleep disruption, other causes of insulin resistance, pregnancy, chronic liver disease, need steroids. And obviously, the obesity and sedentary and sleep disruption are all increasing quite a lot in our society. We have family history, ethnicity, some genetic and epigenetic factors, and then we have environmental factors. These persistent organic pollutants, I think, are becoming relevant and important environmental factor. If you have all three of these together, you go from having this healthy islet with 3,000 beta cells per islet to losing your beta cells in large part and uh, developing type 2 diabetes. But despite that, you still have beta cells left. So what is it about those beta cells that's not functioning? I think it's instructive to look at this graph of plasma glucose on the left versus how many beta cells people have. This is a human study now. Don't worry about the colors so much, but just look that it seems as though you can lose beta cells down to a certain point and then bad <coughs> things happen. It happens to be a loss of about 50% of normal and we see this dramatic decompensation. This says that we have beta cells over here, but they're not working. And if they would work, or they would work better, we could actually perhaps reverse diabetes for a large part. So what is it about those, those beta cells um, when you get down to a critical number? So this in, then leaves the future questions I posed before, the unanswered ones. How does IPP toxicity harm beta cell function? Uh, is the functional change reversible? And is the gradual loss of beta cells inevitable, or can it be prevented? And the reason I'm finishing on those points is that your very own um, Slavata Tudzerova has joined the lab two years ago, or has her own lab, and joined us on the faculty at UCLA, and she has done an absolutely fantastic job at attacking these three questions. Um, and so you have the, tr the good fortune of hearing her speak very shortly. Because you're also polite, you have the misfortune of hearing her speak in English, I think, because one English speaker is in the room when she should be speaking in Macedonia, and I should be sent out to the local bar. But nonetheless, <laughs> I hope you understand English is uh, better. And so this is our research group, and here is Slavica in the back here. Um, and the work I presented is, I, of course, all these people. I'm the one who struggles to keep up with them. So on that note, I thank you. And again, happy birthday. Congratulations to the future Mayo Clinic of the Balkans. I'm very proud to have been here for the first birthday party. Thank you. much for your very comprehensive lecture and uh, new data which were presented as a key factor in pathophysiology of the uh, diabetes mellitus. The discussion will be at the end of this session. Uh, thank you for your presentation, which was completely new and new of the pathophysiology of our chemical bolesis, to je iznese i poradi pobrzanosti so ova predavanje nije napravljena mala izmena i se ja namesto da zborova profesor Bogojev će zborova koleškata Slavica samo da iznesem nekoliko podataci za